Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are back with another fantastic season of United Shades of America with Kamal Bell. And ladies and gentlemen, look who just showed up on my screen. It is not a Muppet. It is the man himself. But one day I think they will have a Muppet of you on Sesame Street. It's going to happen. Don't worry. We're working on it right now. Um, welcome. Uh, how, how many seasons is this? This is season seven, the magical number, seven seasons. Wow. Yeah, yeah. You've got some great Showbiz stuff. Hall of Fame. Um, <laughs> Showbiz Hall of Fame. We're on our way. Um, yeah. So you have there's so much variety um, in all the seasons. This one in particular, because there are some things in here that I was like, oh, I didn't know that. Um, and speaking of didn't know that, let's let's look at one of these clips. This is black folks in Appalachia. Now, was it, I didn't know that, which is ignorant on my part, um, because what you usually see from Appalachia and the Appalachian Mountains is, uh, you know, white folks. And it's usually, you know, people who are destitute um, and struggling. And this is a really interesting look. So we're going to look at that clip and then you're going to talk to me about how it is you came up with this and got there and what it was like. So I'm actually walking the Appalachian Trail right now? You are. You are. <laughs> Those mountains there, those are some of the oldest mountains in the world. When you see the Swiss Alps, they're so big. That's because yeah. they're babies. These, <laughs> these are the grandmothers. Crystal Good is a sixth generation West Virginia native, founder of Black by God. That's how you say it. Appalachia's first all black newspaper. She's going to show me around and introduce me to the people and places at the core of Black Appalachia. You know, a lot of these narratives that paint an Appalachian stereotype, they forget that not all Appalachia is white people. Mm -hmm. And folks like me and my family don't necessarily get into that narrative. And that's why I'm excited to be, I think, the docent of Appalachia. Oh, the docent of Appalachia. Yeah. <laughs> that's a, is that an official title? Or I, don't know, you... I just made it up. <laughs> <laughs> the docent of Appalachia, that, that's new. Um, what was it like? Um, the, the, you know, we in the positions that we are in um, have the opportunity to go into places that a lot of people aren't familiar with um, and that we should be going into more, not less. Uh, tell me what it was like being there and what you discovered. Well, you know, it's funny, a lot of the episodes this season are sort of like a little bit of like follow ups of things we sort of maybe discovered along the way of the last few of the first six seasons. And so I think it was in season two or three, we did an episode about uh, coal miners in Appalachia. And in that episode, one of our producers, Geraldine Porras, walked past something called the Lynch Colored School, the Lynch Colored School. And she was like, Kamau would be interested to know what's going on in this building. And we met some black ex coal miners in Appalachia. And so this was like, there's more to find out there than that one segment we did of the show. So this was about like going back in and digging deep and actually really connecting with a lot of the black communities in Appalachia. And it's interesting, it's, it's, it is definitely not what you expect if you don't live there. A lot of mixed kids in Appalachia. So it's not, the communities are not separate and hating on each other in the way we might think in a place like that. They are, they are pretty well mixed in together because they're in the mountains and there's not a lot of places to separate, I think. All right, I, I, that one, I'm just, I can't wait to see the whole episode. Um, you always bring to light so many things that we um, just aren't familiar with on a, on a grand scale in this country. Um, now, your next one, is, we're going, we are swinging. We're just going like this, like whiplash. Um, it's just whiplash and I love it. Um, athletes and the cost of winning. We're gonna look at this clip. Um, Athletics has always brought us together in some way, shape, or form, especially during the Olympics where people feel great pride. Um, I want everyone to see this clip first and then we will talk about it on the back end. As quiet as it's kept, gymnastics is as hard and pressure-filled a sport as they come. Football's tough, but they wear pads. The only pads you see here Whoa. are the calluses. <laughs> oh, 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 my hamstrings. All right, cartwheel. Oh, this is... You better get way in front of me. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, yes! Got it! So I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, competitive gymnastics is really hard. 
little bit. Just, just a little bit. <laughs> just a tad. Coaches Sarah Mulo, Brianna McNeil, and Mike Hahn have been teaching at Reading Gymnastics for a combined 38 years. And while this may be the seven to 10 year olds class, this ain't child's play. Woo! Oh my goodness. <laughs> If you're competitive, what's your daily schedule like? They go to school and then coming to this club right. practice. What time are you leaving here at, for a nighttime practice? Nine, yeah. We're out of here at nine most days. So then you go home and do homework. Mm -hmm. Wow. It, I mean, it, it, it is a lot. It, is it too much? <laughs> like, well, it... the thing, gymnasts are so disciplined. If you can handle gymnastics, you can handle most anything, I feel. How did I do today? Good. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about that. Will I ever be as good as you all? No. How <laughs> excellent. No, no, I think it's fair. I appreciate your honesty. I and why won't I ever be as good as you all? We need to shrink. <laughs> and so what do you want to do in gymnastics? How far do you want to go? I want to go to the Olympics. OK. I also want to go to the Olympics. 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 Um, probably a teacher. Yeah. <laughs> a teacher who goes to the Olympics? Yeah. <laughs> Um, but then it turns to something that we all, right, struggle with. So you start with this very light, fun, difficult um, scenario with these kids. Tell me where this goes. You know, this one, this segment was was pretty personal for me because I had two, I have three daughters, but two daughters who started out doing gymnastics the way all lots of little kids, little girls especially, started doing gymnastics. And then there was a point at which my older daughter was sort of like plucked into the, oh, you might be good at this side of things. And and what I saw was how it became a lot less fun for her and she eventually dropped out. And at the same time that was happening, I the, the all the stories broke of Dr. Larry Nasser and all the abuse and sexual abuse of young girls and, and women that he had done while working with Team USA Gymnastics. And so as a parent, me and my wife were like, I'm not mad at you for dropping out of gymnastics because I don't know that this is a safe place for you. So I talked to the, all three of the people you saw me talking to there, you know, it's an awkward time to bring that up in the gym, but I brought it up with the, while the, after the little girls had left about like, how do you deal with being a gymnastics coach right now? And then you're also talking about like Simone Biles getting the twisties and how dangerous gymnastics is. So we, we like to see the glory, but we don't like to know what's going on behind the scenes. And so we talked about that because, because, you know, and also the fact is that, you know, some of these girls who say they want to go to the Olympics, their coaches know a lot of them are not going to the Olympics already, but they're not telling them that necessarily. So it is a, it really, to me, it was really important to do that. And it was really, you know, it's easy to just sort of do the cute kid part, but it, I wouldn't have been doing what I do as a, as a human and as a, and as a parent who had had kids in gymnastics without bringing up the other stuff. You don't know this, but I will, my best friend uh, was a collegiate gymnast. Um, who was in that upper rung, who was a potential, you know, heading on to the, the world and that sort of thing. And she started at five and the stories she tells me about mental, mental health, about how she used to go to bed, completely covered in like 10,000 blankets to try to lose weight. They were weighed every single time. I mean, there's all these things. People have no idea how hard it is on these kids. Um, and she was committed to it and she wanted to do it. But you know, there were issues in her gym too. And so I think um, this is a really important uh, topic uh, for any athlete or for anyone that's a part of a team, right? I mean, the, the mental health aspect of anything, um, we are finally starting to talk about, thank goodness. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I think that like, you know, I think the other thing about but what we call women's gymnastics often involves teenagers, you know? So I think the other thing is that the, these, are, these are young women or kids who are sort of being like encouraged to make decisions that will affect the rest of their lives at a time when shouldn't you just be having fun? You know, should are you prepared to 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 go to this class, go to coaching, and then go do homework at nine o'clock at night as an eleven year old? You know what I mean? So to me, there's a it, we we asked all those questions, and it's it's, it's important. To get the pressure, it's real. The pressure is really real when you get into those sort of very upper echelons of competing. Um, this this next one is near and dear to my heart. Um, as someone who's lived in, in California for a very long time, uh, the title is California is Burning. That is all you need to know about what's coming up next. Let's watch that clip. A couple years ago, the campfire burned just a quarter mile from here. And so they've been kind of living with this extreme fear of fire. And so we got this effort started locally to make it easier for landowners to burn their own land. 
The objective is to not kill the big trees, but we do want to kill little baby trees, we want to kill brush. The more that communities that live in these kinds of environments can use fire, mm -hmm. the better off they're going to be. If you each grab a torch, um, we'll get moving on this. My eight-year-old dreams come true. This is part of a larger conservation project that Don and Zeke are involved in, training people in the practice of prescribed fire. We got lots of different fuel types out here, right? We got oak leaves, we got pine needles. The pine needles burn better. And I'm learning along with other members of the community. They want to help protect our state by safely using good fire in a controlled setting. The key word is controlled. Good day to light a fire. There you go. That's good. Let's go. We're just burning up the easy, dry grass. And we're going to just work our way down slope with our ignitions. Small spot fires are slowly lit down the hill, supervised by Zeke and Don. Everyone has a radio and a weather spotter checks for any sudden changes in the wind, and Cal fire officers are standing by. Can you tell I'm trying to say, don't try this at home? Um, you with a blowtorch, I, listen, maybe not a good idea. I look idea. good out there. I look, I look I like the hat. I got, we got a hat that fit me. I, was, I looked like I was ready for, for action. And you know, yeah, you don't you want to put a blowtorch to the hair. <laughs> no, 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 no. The hair is uh, Lloyd's of London insured. Uh, but yeah, we, by the, um, we, as you see in the episode, it really the, we, that we set a lot of that part of the land on fire. And I think the the big takeaway from that episode is that California and the large parts of the world have to learn how to live with fire. You can't stop these fires. Nature uses fire as a way to sort of keep nature at bay. It's like nature's haircut. But the problem is, yeah. is that because we've encroached on nature so much, we haven't allowed nature to do it in a way that's healthy. And so this is about encouraging nature in a, in a positive way. Uh, you know, there is such a serious, serious side to this. Um, I love you always come at it with such which, such good humor, but you always get to the, the hard parts. Um, and the hard parts are we have seen what has happened. Um, it was incredible to me how quickly the, the pine needles caught. I mean, it was you didn't have to do anything. You're just like, oh, well, OK, it's on fire. Yeah. Um, but for anyone who lives in the West in particular, um, across the West, these fires are getting hotter they're burning faster. They are sometimes just impossible to control. You talk to any firefighter who goes out and deals with wildfires. Um, and we're in a real situation here. What did, what did you learn about I me? Mean, you're, you're in California. What did you learn about how bad things could get or are getting? Well, it's, it's, it's brought me a whole new level of respect for what we, we make fun of the weatherman or the weather, weather woman, uh, as far as like weather really determines a lot of this. So California wildfires can make the air bad in Montana. So the idea being that like, even if you think this is just a California issue, that air that the toxic air from the fires can spread all over the country. I think it got out to New York at one point, but so I think the idea being that like, we, we sort of think, we think fire understands the state's lines and borders, but fire does not understand that. And then I talked to some firefighters who talked about how much longer the fire season has gotten. In California, as you know, we have winter, spring, summer, fall, and fire season. And fire season used to be a part of the summer into the early fall. And now it is most, it is most if not all of the summer, into, the, into sometimes the winter because we are in a drought. So, you know, firefighters are being exhausted out here. They can't, they can't find enough firefighters. And then this is where the United States W. Kamau Bell Park comes in. We actually train, the state of California trains inmates to be firefighters when they're in prison, but then when they get out of prison, people don't want to hire those firefighters because they were in prison. So there's a right. firefighter shortage, but we also don't want to hire the people we train to be firefighters uh, while they were in prison. You know what? You, always, you get to all the things. You just always get to all the things. Um, we do. We and can. this next one, I'm a bit jealous because uh, you. It, 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 the clip is called Hawaii for Hawaiians. I'm going to yeah. leave it there and keep my jealousy at bay as we watch this clip. Mm -hmm. So I sat down with three native Hawaiians on Waikiki Beach, a famous surf spot and the epicenter of Hawaii's tourism industry. Jody Clark, Cliff Capono, and Kalise Keleopaa are world-class surfers who are continuing the native tradition of this sport. Surfing is something that's passed along. I think you can see it throughout the islands. We 
bring our children to the beach and we put them on surfboards. It seems like it'd be a hard place to surf if you're a local. I look out there, it's, it looks like the DMV in the ocean. Totally. Like, totally like, yeah. When you grow up here, yeah. you learn how to navigate your way totally. throughout all these people. So was this beach always like this? Always. Never seen an empty Waikiki Kuhio Beach like when COVID happened. Hawaiian families that don't normally come down here because it's so crowded, they got to enjoy Waikiki clean, beautiful beach. I, it was amazing. Within a month, the ocean life restored itself. Fish that I've never seen in my oh, life wow. that come in schools. I think we cherish that moment so, so much because that is what Hawaii could have been. There's nobody here except for Hawaiian local families. Yeah. It's like little rules too that you have. When we see another family at the beach, we don't sit in front of them because it's like you're connecting with the ocean, with yeah. your family, but here they'll just see you and then, oh, there's a better spot right in front of you and they'll just sit right in front. <laughs> Isn't that the whole, like, you know, the, the whole problem of sort of tourism as it's currently constructed? is that it's about me. I'm going to Hawaii with my family, and we want to have our Hawaii experience. I'm only here for six nights and seven days. <laughs> wow. Now, you know you're going to get some response from, from the tourists like us. <laughs> um, I got some response from the tourists who watch the edits of this show. <laughs> I bet you did. Um, but t tell me what sparked this, um, because it is a very interesting concept um, to make people think outside of themselves. You know, we so we did a Hawaii episode uh, a couple seasons ago, and it was really about sort of really establishing the fact that Hawaii was stolen by the United States of America, that Hawaii never said we would like to become a state. And so it was really just about establishing the fact that when we think of native land in this country, we need to be thinking of Hawaii as native land that really has a lot of its natives still on it. We think about the United States, genocide of Native Americans. You don't see Native Americans that often unless you are in community with them. But on Hawaii, the natives are very much still there. And so the idea, we did that episode. And this became an episode that in large part was informed by the pandemic because at a time when many continental Americans who had means and money couldn't travel outside of the, the country, they looked at Hawaii as being outside of the country. And then many people as they were remote working were like, oh, I can remote work from Hawaii. But again, they come in with a tourist mentality. Oh, they, there's we talked about in this episode about the idea of, people on Instagram posting undiscovered beaches in Hawaii, as if Hawaii didn't know that those beaches were there. You know, so the idea being that we look at it as like, as like a foreign land that has been undiscovered. And when you say that, you're ignoring the fact that people have lived there, as they would say, since time immemorial. That's fair enough. And it is an interesting way to flip the, the sort of tourism industry on its head, because it also, you know, has its impacts um, economically, which, you know, the governments, of course, and, and some of the people they're like, but there is a very different side to it. Um, I'm so totally and I would say, and I would say to that too is that we talked, we actually talked to people who work in the hotels there, some of the uh, mm. staff that works in the hotels, and they're finding right now that post pandemic, the hotel industry has really come back. The hotels are like 80, 90 percent capacity, but the people who run the hotels have learned that those of us who are tourists have learned to expect less because of COVID. So then they are then laying off a lot of their staff because they can tell us, we're not going to clean your room every day because of COVID. Right. And we're like, oh, thank you for not cleaning my room every day. What that means is that a whole bunch of staff gets laid off. And these, a lot of these people are in unions. So then they're just sort of waiting for when they can come back to work. And so it's, you know, even those people who work in the tourist industry, who rely on the tourist industry for their income, know that there's a problem with it. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Didn't we learn that in school? Did you learn that? I learned that on Sesame Street. I, I learned too. that in school. Uh, well, in school yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are, we are, okay, can I just admit something? I really hate this word, but I'm going to oh, say- Oh, I, I know what it is. Can I, can I get, it's like a game show, can I guess? Yeah, go ahead. Woke. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> that word, I don't know why it grates on my nerves, but it does. Um, same, same. I think it's because it's, because it's partly been co-opted. Anyway, there's just, you, you know. Um, we but talk, we talk about the episode, yeah. Yes, your next clip is called, and I'm saying it only for you, Kamal, The Woke War. Here it is. 
<laughs> CRT, I think, stands for causes racial tension. <laughs> I've seen it at board. I don't think that's what it stands for, but I I've seen it at board meetings, yeah. and it's very divisive. It's not unifying, and it turns American values upside down. The CRT is using race because it's immutable. It's immutable. You mean it's immutable? You can't change your race. I mean, you're stuck. You are what you are. As you said, it's an academic turn. Isn't it a way they're observing race and how it functions through the law in American society? I don't know. And to give you an example of something that CRT might cover is, for instance, say, redlining in the 70s. And they would explain, OK, the reason we have these huge disparities between black and white homeownership is because there was redlining, which, by the way, literally was a red line that yes. was drawn around there the There are maps with red lines around right. black they, communities. We, 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 do you know that there is still, I can't help it, I, I, I can't. There is, one of our reporters, Nick Watt, this wonderful story in Beverly Hills, there are still clauses about not letting black folks and Jewish folks live in Beverly Hills. It's still in the paperwork and they said, well, we, we're not gonna change it because it costs too much money, blah, blah, but it is still there. So, yeah, 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 so, yeah. this is a big one and a divisive you sound woke to topic. Me. You sound woke. Lord, please. Do you have to keep saying the word? <laughs> we wanted to call this one um, World War Woke, but we couldn't get away with it. Oh, my God. Th th I literally was thinking that that would yeah. be the perfect title. Um, so the bottom line is this one is going to set people on fire, right? I mean, literally with the arguments. Uh, what did you tackle? What, did, what drew you to this other than the complete obviousness of we're fighting over it like cats and dogs. I mean, it was one of those things that, you know, it's in the news, the stories are sort of out there. And those of us who are inside this industry sort of like, sometimes we're like, are we really talking about this? <laughs> and you sort of wait for it to go away and it doesn't go away. And so it sort of felt like an assignment. It didn't really feel like a thing that I was like, ooh, let's do this. But then it's like, if we're gonna do this, how do we do this in a way that feels, that feels like we're, we're helping or we're at additive and not just exploitative. And so we went in through the whole school idea, the idea of like, because the scary thing about the woke war, as we call it, is that right now there are schools that are not going to teach an accurate history of the United States of America because they have decided that CRT is in the schools and the schools are getting too woke. And that means the next generation of kids is not going to have access to the same type of facts that me and you grew up with. And when we, when we see where the country's at is now, that is scary. That is scary to think that we are going to literally whitewash the history of this country and it will affect how this country goes forward. And right now it's basically a jump ball if this American democracy lasts much longer. So for me, this is like, we have to go through the school, through the idea of the school districts. And then we talk to teenagers in high school about the fact, because this woke thing we think about is race, but it also gets into the LGBTQ plus community and kids who are in school who are now, as we talk about a little bit, the don't say gay bill in Florida, the so-called don't say gay bill, uh, the, what I call it, the don't say gay bill. When we talk about that is the idea is that you're actually erasing the lives of the kids who are in school right now. And what and what kind of school should be doing that? Who wants to go to a school that is actually erasing your life? And, and I have to say, you always you know, talk to many of the different facets and the sides, if you will, um, of these issues and, and get out in a very humane way. And I, and I do appreciate that. And I think you're, the people who watch um, really appreciate that. Um, you said that this was sort of the, the assignment was trying to get to where we are. Did you understand the assignment? That's all I need to know. <laughs> well, I understood the assignment the way, the way <laughs> I wanted to understand the assignment. <laughs> the way I was raised to understand the assignment. So yeah, I think I understood. <laughs> well, you this understood one, the assignment. This one, the song is... <laughs> yeah. No, it's, and this oh, one takes place right. in, in Arizona. So no better place to do this okay. in Arizona, maybe Florida, but we did it in Arizona. Yeah, I mean, it's listen, it's all across the country, uh, Virginia, Arizona, Florida, you, you, you name the place, um, San Francisco. I mean, they, they're, folks, are, they, yeah. it's a really, really, really interesting. Um, uh, I mean, you go, and, you know, elite private schools in New York. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. like it is not what? just a left right issue, you know. It's touched uh, a lot of people and a lot of people who don't have kids in school, too. I noticed will show up at some of these well, we, uh, board we, meetings. We have the, as well. two of the Did people in that thing that in there? do not have kids in schools, and they're in there. Very at the interesting meetings. to me. All right, our next one, another one close to my heart, um, Asian Americans in the spotlight. Um, you, this, is, this is sort of a, a personal journey um, 
for you and for those that are that are represented in this piece. Let's watch the clip. Let's talk about your journey in here. I, I've read your bio. It's a bio that any parent would be proud of. <laughs> you know, Thank like, Dad. <laughs> Bing Chen lives in the future. When he was a big wig at YouTube, he saw influencer culture coming and helped to make sure that influencers got paid for it. He's an entrepreneur who sees a future where Asian Americans get all the representation they want and more. The best analog I had when I was a kid was like, Walt Disney makes dreams come true. How do you make that real? Like, how do you make anyone's dream come true at a really practical level? It starts with Gold House, his nonprofit collective of Asian American leaders that basically makes sure that when Asian media comes out, people are looking for it. We are looking at the Asian diaspora, where the majority of the world, four and a half billion, we're the fastest growing population in this country. And yet, we are the most objectified in media. So there's just this clear disparity. And so I think the imperative for an institution like Gold House that we collectively created, this just goes to the age old adage of you can either take a house or you can build your own house. One of its first big successes was getting the word out about crazy rich Asians. And the question was, how do we ensure that this is successful? Because the film right now is going to underperform. And so we said, all right, we're going to get everyone together in a way they never have. For years, black folks have encouraged people to support black movies by buying out theaters. Because in Hollywood, if a movie has a big opening weekend, then more movies like that get made. That means more representation. Goldhouse borrowed that idea for the opening weekend of Crazy Rich Asians, and it worked to the tune of almost $240 million. This movie is making history. The summer blockbuster, Crazy Rich Asians. Seeing what Gold House did for Crazy Rich Asians, really, it's showing the power that the community has. I, I had some concerns. Like, is this the movie that we want to? <laughs> it's not Malcolm X. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. exactly. Like, crazy Rich stuff. Asians. Yeah. How I justified it was, it, it was still a love story. Mm. And you never saw Asians you know, in rom-coms. So many of us who've been in the business for a long time have sort of felt like we've been the only one climbing up this ladder and it's a very lonely ladder and so to know that there are organizations now taking it upon themselves right to promote and to build infrastructure well the fact that we're having this conversation right now for television you know means we're moving in the right direction yeah this is a i I love, I love all your guests. Nice to see Lisa Ling. <laughs> I know that was the, the first Lisa Ling, uh, you know, the first time me and Lisa Ling have had a crossover. So when I, when I, Lisa conceived, Ling. when we were conceiving this show, I was like, we have to get Lisa. Me and Lisa have gotten a lot closer since the pandemic. We've just, you know, connected a lot. And so I really value her as a friend and really in some sense wanted to pay tribute to her as someone who has been doing this work for a long time and really feel like I don't I don't know that Lisa's gotten all of her flowers and so I wanted to be make sure that I was there to help throw some of those flowers at her feet and hand them to her because I think she she is a revolutionary force for good in this industry. Yeah, she's a, she embodies so many good things. Um, you, when you look at this, you know, something struck me in that clip and, and it it was, you know, I love the movie. Was it, me, like eating, was it, it. Me, me eating with my mouth open? Was that what struck you with that clip? Because that, that's what listen, struck I'm me. Not, listen, I'm sure your mother will have something to say. I have met your mother. I'm sure she will have something to say, like, come out. It's hard to eat and talk. <laughs> I know. It's always a bad idea, but we do it. It's life, right? Um, especially when it gets caught on camera. Um, but what, what, what struck me is... You know, we look at some of these movies and now that they're successful, right? Everyone's like, oh God, we gotta make more, we gotta do. But what it takes to do that because um, the studios or whomever are behind some of these films think it's too niche is so upsetting. It, it, it's, it is as if human beings cannot, you know, watch someone who doesn't look exactly like them and not feel the humanity of that other person. The movie is good. I don't care who's in it, it's, it's good, right? Yeah. And it's also it, everything doesn't have to be for everybody. I think we understand that with whiteness, that there is like, you know, I'm sure Kevin Costner is making another golf movie right now. You know, like I'm sure he's he keeps, you know, there's they, they keep making Westerns. Like Kevin Costner is obviously making another Western right now. We have to understand everything is not for everybody. And so, like, for example, with right now, my daughters are watching Ms. Marvel on uh, Disney Plus. They are not mm. South Asian. 
They do not live in New, uh, New Jersey like she does, but she is a brown girl who is doing a cra- magical superhero things that they relate to. And when you look at the, the who made Miss Marvel, it is clearly intentional that it was made by people from this culture. And whereas like if that if Miss Marvel had been made 10 years ago, it probably would be made by white men and they would have cast just the brown people on, on camera. So the important part is, as we have slowly started to learn, representation is also important behind the camera, which is why Helen was there. Helen Cho was there, who's directed episodes of the United Shades and also is the showrunner for Lisa Ling's show Takeout. Because she's somebody, when I met her, she had never directed before. And she came to me and was like, I want to direct an episode of the United Shades. She'd worked with Parts Unknown with Tony for years and never gotten to direct. She's like, is that OK? And I was like, of course it's OK. Why would I, why would I stop you? And so <laughs> that's also the, the important part of this episode is about representation on camera, behind the scenes, in politics, we talked to a politician. In podcasting, for, we have little uh, Chinese American kids podcasting. Representation everywhere, not just on camera. It's a, it's really um, an important um, part of our society, and people don't realize how impactful uh, movies have been in, in many of our lives. And I think you could say that still for the population. I'm, sh- I, you know, I can remember so many films that like drew me in, uh, at books as well, uh, written by different people. And I, you know, I mean, I'm, I'll watch Dumb and Dumber and laugh my behind off. Um, but I also mm-hmm. want to see Malcolm X, right? I also yes. want to see those films. Um, and so it, it, I, I just, I think this episode is really going to speak to a lot of people. Um, all right. I mean, you got so many episodes here. I mean, did you sleep at all when you got? I mean, <laughs> no. I mean, we're let's remember there's still a pandemic happening, so there was all that stress too. We were just able to be inside a little bit more this season. So this was this was a this was one of the hardest seasons we've ever filmed of this show because we were still dealing with the pandemic and also we're dealing with the fraying of American democracy happening all around us and feeling like these episodes have to address that and have to be clear which is still happening now considering what is is going on with the jan 6 committee and and all the Mm -hmm. things that we've been seeing i mean we're in a very serious time how does kamal bell keep all that humor just put it on a plate for all of us to to eat off of every single day i mean i wouldn't know how to do this if i wasn't laughing sometimes so like uh and and if i wasn't allowed to be myself i think even in that scene in the scene we showed from the woke episode when the guy says CRT means causing racial tension. You can see my face like, mm, mm, I don't know. like that's me sort of like alleviating the tension so I don't just start screaming and crying. <laughs> you know, like now, now there are times actually before that scene because we've been shooting all this woke stuff and I've been talking about these people who I didn't agree with. I just laid on the ground before that scene just to be like, Black Jesus, help me get through this next scene. <laughs> so there are times where I have to take a mental health break. Uh, it's why it's important that the crew. This is the first season of the show we've had an all black camera crew. It really helps to have a crew that I can look at who who afterwards when the scene ends, they can be like, brother, you did it. I saw it, I felt it. They know what I'm going through. So for me, it's like, it's really about making sure I'm surrounded with people who get it. And also without the humor, I don't know, I wouldn't be of any use to this job, I don't think, because I'm, I'm not a journalist as you point out all the time. Uh, I do not point that out. That's, that's all on you now because you do represent <laughs> <laughs> the different sides of the argument, which is journalistically sound, I would like to say. Um, and, and you do it with humor, but you come at it from a certain perspective. Um, and you're clear about that. This isn't, you know, you hiding anything. This is you like letting it all hang out there. And like you said, if you weren't laughing, you might be crying. So uh, mm-hmm. laughter, I, I would I would vote for laughter every single time. Kamal Bell, I cannot wait to see season seven of United Shades of America with Kamal Bell. We got to make sure that name is always on there. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's you. It's I you. fought to get my I name in the title, so. <laughs> Listen, I know why, and I love it. It's great. Thank you. Um, thank thank you. you so much. Uh, we, I will be seeing you on TV. Maybe one day I'll actually see you in person because right now you've just been a hologram to me. You know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> one day, one day. <laughs> Thanks, Kamal. Thank you.